Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9, The Bigger Picture. The word SARS conjures up frightening memories for most Canadians. It was a deadly virus that raced through the city of Toronto eight years ago, killing dozens, making hundreds sick and instilling fear. In a 16 by 9 exclusive tonight, we track down SARS victims who were quarantined, separated from family and friends, and facing the possibility of dying alone. Our Beatrice Politi reveals some haunting, never before told stories. It's a new virus. It's a new pathogen. We don't even know for sure which virus it is. March 2003, Toronto is under attack by a mysterious new disease. It's very hard to stop. It's like a, a brush fire that's throwing off sparks. A virus out of control. A city under virtual quarantine. China, four months earlier, already in the grip of the terror. Thousands sick, many dead. For three months, they hid the sick and dying. Finally, February 2003, China reveals the outbreak. Doctors in this country and others around the world are rushing to identify a deadly mystery illness. There's a new outbreak. The control measures don't seem to be working. There's no vaccine to prevent it. And researchers around the world say no cure is likely anytime soon. It's too late. SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, is already infecting the world. March 2003, it lands in Toronto. Its first Canadian victim, a woman who died within days of returning to Toronto from Hong Kong. The chain of infection had begun. We don't even know for sure which virus it is. We don't understand what it does to people. Day by day, the cases mounted. The Ontario total of deaths for patients from SARS is now nine. Nurses, doctors, paramedics start gowning and gloving up. It was the spring of fear. And I remember just lying in bed, struggling just to catch my breath. March 2003, emergency medical worker Bruce England is in charge of a crew that calls him about a patient with strange symptoms. I stopped what I was doing, went immediately to the Scarborough Grace, spoke to the crew for a few minutes, interviewed the patient. That patient had SARS. He later died. It was the night Bruce's whole life would change. Within days, he began to feel aches and pains. He called a doctor about his symptoms. An ambulance arrived within minutes. Six people came into the, my house in full personal protective equipment, gowns, masks, goggles and gloves. I remember they, when they put oxygen on me, it was just like I could breathe. I had this wicked headache to, to die for. Late March, Brian Gardner, an electrician, worked a weekend shift with a co-worker. He uh, left early because he wasn't feeling well. Two days later, on Monday, Tuesday, I had a severe headache and fever, and I was not feeling well. Brian began to worry he had the disease everyone was talking about. He went for an x-ray. When they did the x-rays, they said, you have SARS. Everybody was sort of hearing about this, you know, strange pneumonia and, you know, a strange pneumonia that had hit uh, the Scarborough Grace. Nurse Lena Stewart was busy looking after patients. It was late March 2003 and she was worried. And I asked my boss, you know, and I said, uh, are we to be using masks, you know, if you feel like it? You know, if it makes you feel any better, you can, you know, you can wear masks. A few days later, she's on shift with a very sick co-worker. You know, I said to her, I said, you know, you look like hell. You know, like, and she turns around and she goes, yeah, I, you know, I feel horrible. The co-worker had SARS. Two days later, Lena got sick. You just whipped. You feel like you've been hit by a Mack truck and nothing's relieving it. And your joints were so, so, so sore. It was amazing. I'd never felt such pain. Um, childbirth was easy compared to the pain in those joints. That excruciating pain was SARS. You hear the words, but it was a disbelief. Bruce, Lena, Brian were about to fight for their lives. But the fever was so high that your body tuned it out after a while. You didn't feel the pain anymore. It wouldn't register. 
but you knew you were fighting for your life. A fight they would have to do alone, quarantined, cut off from family. They, you know, brought me upstairs to a, an isolation room, I guess. The whole floor was like you were completely isolated. It was all plastic off with vapor barrier as you get off, I guess, the elevator. And that whole, I guess, area of the hospital was completely quarantined off. I remember a lot of the, the isolation, the loneliness of it. I remember sitting, it was one of the first times I was able to sit up in bed. And that probably took me an hour and a half to get the strength to sit up. And a nurse came in and sat down beside me. Double gowns, double goggles, double gloves, double face masks. She sat down on the bed beside me. She put her arm around my shoulder and said, Bruce, you're gonna pull through. You're a strong man. You're gonna get through this. For a harrowing six weeks, SARS stalked its victims. In Toronto, over 330 people fell ill. 44 died. I guess we went through a war, uh, a mental war. Are we going to die? Are we going to live? I went into a stage where I saw the light. I, I started to feel no pain and then I saw the beautiful white light and I guess I went out of it or I was on my way out to heaven or something like that. Brian, Lena and Bruce pulled through. As quickly as the crisis started, it seemed to end. Toronto declared itself SARS-free. Life in Canada's biggest city was back to normal. But the victims who survived the fight against SARS had more battles ahead. Coming up on 16 by 9. No one expected this of SARS. It's a severe pneumonia. People anticipated that after a year, people generally get better. This didn't happen with the SARS group. They just, it's turned into a chronic illness. That's all coming up. Welcome back to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. For many, SARS is just a distant memory. The outbreak may be over, but many survivors still feel the impact every day. Here again is our Beatrice Politi. My name is Bruce England, and I survived SARS. My name is Brian Gardner. Uh, I'm a SARS survivor. My name is Lena Stewart. I don't know whether I can actually say I'm a survivor of SARS because I haven't survived it yet. Bruce England, Brian Gardner, and Lena Stewart are three of the lucky ones who battled SARS and escaped with their lives. But eight years later, they haven't won the war. I can get one or two pneumonias a year, um, constantly tired, have issues with concentration, I have to struggle sometimes. My hands go numb, cataract in one eye and had that done in 2006, and now the other eye's gone. I have arthritis and constant pain in all my major joints. Debilitating and puzzling symptoms. Dr. Paula Gardner is a clinical psychologist at St. John's Rehab Hospital in Toronto. No one expected this of SARS. It's a severe pneumonia. People anticipated that after a year, people generally get better. This didn't happen with the SARS group. They just, it's turned into a chronic illness. Chronic illness that Dr. Gardner has studied with a group of SARS survivors for the last eight years. You okay? Yeah, I just got a breath. They're in agony, physically and psychologically, but doctors cannot figure out why. We don't know if it was the viral infection causing these lingering symptoms or if it was the high doses of uh, steroids that they were treated with. Um, when they were severely ill. Dr. John Patkai works with the same patients and is just as baffled. They, they seem to have been previously relatively normal people who got hit with a giant illness. There were aches and pains. There were cognitive problems. At this rehab gym, occupational therapist Elaine Chan tries to help SARS survivors get on with their lives. Mostly, she sees pain. It was very apparent that they would fatigue very quickly and they would also have shortness of breath um, with just very light exercises, with light lifting, with light carrying. The clients were not able to concentrate for long durations. They could not concentrate on 
forming a grocery list. People see them and they look good or they look normal, they look fine, and yet they're not. In fact, in 2007, 88% of the SARS survivors in the St. John's rehab program had failing health. In the country where the deadly disease started, China, things for SARS survivors are arguably even worse. Horrible, lingering symptoms. This photo essay says it all. Huang Hua and his wife got SARS in March 2003. She died. Eight years later, his bones are disintegrating. The best guess? It's from massive doses of hormones used to treat SARS. Yung Si Sheng got SARS along with nine other family members. The disease decimated her life. Young survived, but she is trapped in a living hell. Huang lives with the same scars inside and out. Back in Canada, the same stories of pain and loss. Bruce, before, fit, strong, the head of an emergency management team. Today, he struggles with the simplest tasks. It's just, it's just balancing. The balance part? Yeah. Okay. Brian, before, daredevil, adventurer, the life of the party. Today, he can barely keep pace with seniors. My neighbors, you know, uh, he's 82, and I see him out there early doing all kinds of stuff, and I'm jealous he's got more energy than I have. Lena, before. I was a long distance runner, hockey, the kids, worked two jobs full time. And now, the psychological trauma has really been devastating. That psychological trauma has a name, post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Many SARS survivors have it. It is one symptom doctors can explain. Dr. Rima Styra is a psychiatrist who treats PTSD sufferers. SARS was really a very traumatic event for everyone. Okay. So whether you were a healthcare worker or you were just someone who contracted SARS, it was a trauma. You thought you were going to die. The fear of dying and weeks of isolation they endured, triggering PTSD. It must have sort of felt like, like, being, like being buried in an underground chamber. It, when they say isolation, it was true isolation. Alone, helpless, and on the verge of dying. You just kept going downhill, downhill, downhill. You know, I didn't see anyone during that entire time in the hospital. For the next three months, I lived in a 10 by 12 room with the kill bucket beside me, which is uh, just a metal bucket with Javix and uh, water in it. That Anything that I attached to it and going out of the room was doused in uh, the Javix to keep it uh, sterile. That terrifying time leaving them eight years later with invisible but lasting scars. I started waking up in the middle of the night and the bed was wet, dripping wet. I was just soaked, I was having night sweats. Couldn't understand, it made no sense to me. I cried and I still cry because my friends and my colleagues looked up to me. I am no longer able to contribute to society in a working way. My career is over. So much is over for Bruce, Lena, and Brian. So much they can no longer do. They're angry about getting a disease they say could have been prevented, but even angrier about how they've been treated since. I can't say I'm not angry. I'm angry, you know what, uh, that it happened. We've been forgotten. I am still dealing with the deteriorating effects of it. I, I think there was a lot of mistakes made. 
Eight years later, there is still anger. Eight years since this, a deadly virus that hit without warning, a crisis that doctors say could strike again any time. I don't think that it's necessarily gone away to, to never come back. Brian, Lena and Bruce hope if it comes back, their stories will serve as a cautionary tale. We can't fix our health, but maybe we can contribute in a way that our stories will impact decisions in the future to avoid things like the mistakes that were made. Mistakes that eight years ago cost many lives. Mistakes that are still today ruining many more.